Hi, by the time you read this, it should be good evening, <clears throat> Wednesday night, hopefully. Uh, welcome to the uh, spring lecture series I'm doing on uh, four parts on the uh, history of Yiddish. The title is uh, Mamaloshin Yiddish, Mamaloshin, that's what they call it. Yiddish and Jewish History tonight should be the second of um, four talks. The title of tonight is Go East Young Men, Yiddish in the Early Modern Era. Um, this is a series, as you see, which is being sponsored. I want to thank the Leventhal's, Ed Mess Leventhal, um, for uh, actually dreaming up this uh, whole topic and sponsoring the series. This is a memory of Ed's mom, Sheena Bas Moshe Madalashom, and his grandma, Olivka Bas Yankel Shmuel, who was from Lithuania, now is from Yiddish land, and uh, hopefully everything will be up and for you guys to be running by Wednesday night. I'm recording this earlier, of course. Uh, two points I want to thank first of all the tech team. I forgot to do that last time. There's three people without which I can't make a move. Now we're in the hardcore over here. My son Yehuda Leib over here is taking from his time to uh, record this. Yossi Westin is going to uh, do the uh, cutting and pasting. And uh, Howard Elbaum uh, worked uh, valiantly to get the PowerPoint out in time. And uh, one last point, this should be out on the YouTube channel. And uh, the more people that subscribe to the channel, the better I'm told it is for the channel. And so if you haven't become a subscriber on my YouTube channel, uh, please do so. Now, instantly. Okay? I'll give you a second. Okay, time's up. Now, let's go down uh, to write, uh, to uh, pick up where we left off last time. I'm doing that in the history of Yiddish. Or better yet, and this is a title that was thought of by Ed Leventhal. It's a, a title that I like better, Yiddish and Jewish History. Because that might be a better way of describing it. Last time, uh, we talked about the origins of uh, Yiddish in the Rhineland and the Middle Ages, right? And we saw how, as, and let's go to our uh, first uh, slide over here. Here we go. Uh, we saw as Germany, the, what you call today the concept of Germany, expanded east, uh, so did Yiddish land. And so as you see over here, at that time it was called the Holy Roman Empire. Primarily this was Germany, plus a few other countries that you can see now that are not German. Uh, but this was the heart of it, and that's Ashkenaz. It was called the Holy Roman Empire. And as it moved to the east, to the right of the map, Jews moved in with them, and they brought their Yiddish-speaking habits there to the eastern part of Germany. By the 15th century, the 1400s in other words, which you generally call the last century of the Middle Ages, Yiddish was the language of all these Jews that you see on the map. Okay? It was even used in Shul instead of Hebrew by women. Uh, here I'm taking you back, and tonight we're going to talk a lot a bit about the women. Uh, I hate to tell you, uh, for those who are too dumb to realize it, they were more than 50% of the population. I'm talking about Jewish. Historically, and uh, pretty pious too, uh, for the most part. And here we have a picture. Let's go to the next one of the old days. It's a wonderful painting from the 19th century. That's the women's Ezra Nashim, and you see the lady with the uh, book. She's reading for the others the prayers in Yiddish. That's what they used to do. So notice Yiddish was so pervasive that in whole sectors of the population, not only women but primarily. Even the davening and things like that were done in the Yiddish language once upon a time. Things are very different today, okay? By the way, she's doing Echa, this is Tisha B'Av, that's what that is. Now, Yiddish, of course, sounded weird to Germans, non-Jews, but in those centuries, uh, the Jews didn't give a hoot what others thought about them. In later centuries, Jews lost their own self-respect, I might say, in the 19th century, became more uh, sensitive to what others were thinking about them, and Maskilim, and uh, the Wissenschaft scholars in Germany would feel very ashamed of Yiddish because it was like a, a poor version of German. And uh, they would then claim, when they wrote in the 19th century, well, the Jews didn't really talk Yiddish in Malaysia. They spoke a uh, real German. It's only recently, unfortunately, due to the Frumkind in the ghettos, that the Jews picked up Yiddish. These are lies. Uh, they tell you more about the people writing these in the 19th and early 20th century than about the historical truth. The Jews had their own language and formed their own language a long, long ago, as I tried to explain to you last time. But it goes to show you, Yiddish brings out your sensitivities as well as your strengths. Now, after the Middle Ages comes what we call in history the early modern period, which is what I want to talk about tonight. Generally speaking, we mean the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s. This is a very specific period in, in, in uh, Western history, and it's also a very specific period in Jewish history. Very, very briefly, this is when the Jews... Um, were kicked out from Germany, ended up in Poland, and this one, the Spartan were kicked out of uh, Spain, ended up in the Turkish Empire in the Middle East. 
and a lot of other things happened during that period. So it's a, it's a definable era in Jewish history. One of the things that defines it as a specific period in Jewish history is exactly what I intend to talk about tonight, and that is the point of Yiddish. Okay? Now, um, in the early modern era, after the Middle Ages, uh, Yiddish expanded tremendously thanks to two megatrends. First of all, there was the expansion of the Ashkenazic Jews eastward, okay? Not East Germany, past East Germany, into the east of what we call the Kingdom of Poland. So you see different maps over there. Look at the one in the bottom, and that's the countries today. That whole area was what we call Poland and Lithuania. The Republic of Poland and Lithuania, which is a kind of a kingdom. I've spoken about that many times. And I imagine if you're the type of person watching what I'm saying right now, you probably saw the elements as well. And you know, and what they call the golden age of Jews in Poland. Well, guess what? When the Jews move out of there, and they're more or less kicked out of Germany, or made to feel very uncomfortable, look, as we speak right now, it's right after this Gaza war now, and a lot of Jews in Europe and in the United States are now feeling uncomfortable. They're thinking of me moving, you see? So that's happened worse at that time in the 12, 13, 1400s. And the Jews in Ashkenaz in Germany moved to the country next door, which is Poland, as you see. And uh, therefore, Poland now becomes, in the early modern era, a grand headquarters of Yiddish. Because these guys bring the Yiddish language with them. Uh, this was, as they say, due to the toxic anti-Semitism in the Holy Roman Empire. Well, listen, Jews remained in Germany, but most Jews left Germany and moved to Poland. I'm using the word Poland in the sense of this map. Eastern Europe, okay, much larger than the country of Poland today. And when the Ashkenazic Jews move to Poland in large numbers, they bring their Yiddish language with them. But in the Polish Empire, um, these Ashkenazic Jews I'm referring to didn't simply move there and find a haven, but you can truly say, Paru by Yishurtsu, by Yerbutsu, by Yatsu, by Mod, Mod, whatever it says, they had a baby boom. The only baby boom that I know about in Jewish history, I repeat, the only baby boom that I know about in Jewish history which is kind of interesting. The population expansion would continue to increase over the 1500s, the 1600s, and the 1700s uh, to the point where more than half the Jews in the world lived in the Shish Pospolitov in the Polish Empire. And that meant that Yiddish, especially if you throw in Germany also where they continue to speak Yiddish, so if you have the Polish Empire plus the Holy Roman Empire together, uh, Yiddish became the language spoken by most Jews in the world. And it will continue to be that way, numerically. That's not a small point. We're not talking about Bagito, which is spoken by 2,000 Jews in, in Livorno. Nobody even knows where Livorno is. We're talking about a language that's spoken for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, by a vast majority of the Jews of the whole planet Earth, Rov Minyan, Rov Minyan, and Kali Yisrael. So demographically, Yiddish expanded tremendously during this period. Now, um, I just want to be clear, those of you who were in my early lectures two years ago, whatever, will remember this. The Jews who used to live, and look at the map over there, yellow, in the upper right-hand corner. That's called the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which was huge at once upon a time. Uh, those Jews uh, did not speak Yiddish in the Middle Ages. Uh, they were from, they had moved there from all over the world. I mean, from uh, Persia, from uh, Byzantine Empire, from Italy. I mean, it's, it's remarkable, okay? But, uh... When you come to the 1500s, the Ashkenazic newcomers who move in, they culturally imperialized them, the locals, thanks to the deep culture and uh, superior Jewish scholarship, Judaic scholarship, that the Ashkenazim brought with them. And it didn't take too long till the Yiddish language is universal throughout that map that you just saw. So if you were talking to me about the 10, 11, 12, 1300s, maybe they're talking other languages to Jews. But if you're talking... 14, really 15, 16, 17 hours, all the Jews, I don't care where you originally came from. There are some people that approach me from time to time and will say, my parents uh, came from this and this place in Poland or in Ukraine or wherever it is, but we have a family tradition that we're Sephardic and we go back to Spain. It's possible. It could be. When the Jews were kicked down in 1492, some ended up, you know, vulgar stuff here and there. Some ended up in, um, in Poland, Lithuania, uh, you know, Ukraine, place like that. Could be, within a short time, they or their children, or their children's children, were talking Yiddish. That's my point. So, I'm, a guy on my shoulder just told me the other day, Kleinberg dad, you know, he found that he's related to Rios of Cairo. Could be, it's possible. But his family's Ashkenazi and they're talking Yiddish. 
you know, his ancestors. So keep that in mind. Now, the story of the Jews in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, this map, is a story of economic prosperity and physical safety. We talked about that in the past. Much better than anywhere else the Jews had it there. Um, much better than anywhere else in the, in the Middle Ages or in the early modern period. This was due to a bunch of factors. The Polish constitutional system, remember you had that nutball constitutional thing, no law can get passed unless it's unanimous in the parliament. The domination of the country by the nobles and the magnates. And the utility of the Jews to the nobles and the magnates. Okay? Which is why, as you see in the headline over here, the Jews used to call this Polin, Polin. We rest here. No, after all the sufferings that we had in all the other countries, finally we had a, 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 a respite here in Poland. A way that American Jews, I'm sorry to say this years ago, I don't think today so much, American Jews just said, oh, finally came to America, Polin. Here we found the respite, an exception. Uh, very briefly, the Jews were able to uh, uh, locate themselves very uh, successfully within the Polish economy, which means they had to be of service to the nobles who owned all this territory. And uh, there was a lot of economic possibilities there because Poland was incredibly rich in natural resources. And Jews made themselves uh, successful of utility as the agents, you might say, the business agents of the nobles. And therefore, the nobles made most of the money, but the Jews made a living too. And some made very good living. Okay? Now, um, as a result, although Poland is a I mean, I won't say they liked the Jews, but they were okay with them being there. Go to the next one. There's that famous Ramah, Ramah, Moshe Isselis. I would say the leading Polish rabbi, perhaps, in Krakow, the capital city of Poland at that time, in a very famous and often quoted uh, letter. It's in the Shalos and Shibbles of the Ramah to one of his students who he finds out uh, moved to Germany and found the shell there. Germany was a toxic anti Semitism. He said, Baruch Ahuvi Amitia, Aluf Avatik. I'm writing to my uh, good friend, as far as Bikias, Rab Hirsch, right? He's writing to a student of his, Hirsch, and he says, I, I, I hear you got a position as a rabbi. I'm glad you got a job, okay? I'm happy to hear that you're okay. You got a job to you, the Rav and the Mora, like you say, the Rav of a community in Germany. However, I prefer to eat a crust of bread and have less anti-Semitism here in Poland. In other words, you may have, he didn't say these words, this implies, you may get a better salary than I do. Don't worry, Ramo is a millionaire, but I'm just saying it's, it's a literary expression. You may get a, a better salary than I do. I prefer to have a Pascha a smaller salary, a dry crust of bread, and less anti-Semitism, uh, in these countries where I live in Poland, the hatred is not as great as it is in Medina Ashkenaz. Okay? Me Yitain, and the Ramos says this is so tragic based on the fact we know about Hitler. Me Yitain, Mishikeno, I hope that the current uh, non anti uh, relatively non anti Semitic environment in Poland. We're made until Mashiach time. Doesn't that sound like American Jews? <laughs> you understand? Now we all know, in the Ramos time maybe, but afterwards came Kralnitsky and then came the other junk, and finally everybody was exterminated, as we all know, in the Holocaust. My point though is, for a while the Jews had arrived there, and that was the Yiddish era. The political stability and economic uh, prosperity reminds us a little bit of a modern America, but there is a gigantic difference in terms <coughs> of Jewish religion and culture between the Polish Jews in the era of prosperity and safety and the Americans. Whereas, in, and this goes to the heart of what I want to talk about tonight, whereas in modern America and in Western countries in general, the good treatment of the Jews, the prosperity of the Jews, has led to acculturation, assimilation, intermarriage, weakening of Jewish loyalties, greater and greater ignorance of Judaism. Do you agree with me or do you disagree? Here, take a look at this. Talk about stupid idiots. It was just a, maybe you saw this the other day. A whole bunch of rabbinical students, by reform, conservative reconstruction, and everything, in other words, not orthodox, uh, signed a joint letter that came out, a uh, hundred of them, urging U.S. Jews to hold Israel accountable for rights abuses. In other words, they came out in, against, for the Hamas and against Israel in this last war. It was a week ago. 
I remind you, these are rabbinical students. Notice these are the future rabbis of Reform Conservative uh, Reconstructionists, or whatever else they call it. Uh, and they're coming out, doesn't sign open letter, accusing Israel of violence, suppression of human rights, and, uh, what is it? Crashing and enabling apartheid in uh, Palestinian territories. While they, I want you to be clear about this. They published this while the Hamas was shooting rockets in Israel a week or ten days ago, whatever it is. So there's no word whatsoever about feeling sorry for the Jews, but it's feeling sorry for the, for the Arabs. My point is that um, this is a striking example of the weakening of Judaic feeling um, that has characterized uh, Western and American Jewry in the age of uh, economic prosperity and uh, political safety. Now, by contrast, in Poland, in those years, you had a full-on Judaism that flourished among the prosperity and acceptance. Let's go to the next one. So, Poland was the golden age of Polish Lithuanian Jewry and the Republic there, the Shesh was Polito, uh, was characterized by what I've always told you about, the four pillars of a traditionalism which flourished, the fundamentalism, the nomianism, the autonomous courts and communities in Poland, you had divided by Ratzos, and the cultural insularity. So uh, this was due to that perfect storm that uh, both the Poles and the Jews wanted the Jews to be there, but not be of there. Okay, this is Poland, it's our country, you're not Polish, you're just what we call resident aliens, have nothing to do with our culture, don't interfere in our society, don't write our books, don't talk about our beliefs and literature, we're Polish, you're not, and the Jews said, that's what we want to. We say the same to you. We're Jewish, don't interfere in Jewish life, in Jewish literature, in Jewish society, and, you know, we're, we're, we're living, what's it get, physically near each other, but that's it, okay? Um, <laughs> it's a certain notion, it's not popular today. I remember years ago, I will not be specific, I knew a lady in a university where I taught long ago, and uh, she was Irish, and uh, this is a long time ago, and she, we were talking, when we used to be friends, and she was saying like this, oh, when I grew up, it was in Bronx and Grand Concourse, and, uh, you know, we, it was us and the Jews, and we got along great. Uh, they had nothing to do with us, we had nothing to do with them. And she was my secret for you, she was not being funny about it. You see, I know exactly what she meant. She was just speaking plain. That was like it was in Poland. Now, um, the result is, let's go to the next one. They had a golden age of cultural insularity. This is political, prosperity cultural insularity with the approval of Polish government. This is a small passage from that famous book, Yvain Mitsula, I did many years ago. That's the famous Jewish account of the Cossack massacres in 1648 and afterwards. And the author, Nathan Hanover, this is very famous, is looking nostalgically, oh, what was the world like before this Holocaust hit us? And he's talking about life in Poland in the old days. And I want you, I'm sharing this with you to show you that the Jews in Yiddish literally had their own world within Poland, and uh, the Poles are okay with it. Look at this. Bakai so you notice now you read Zaslav, you read Yaroslav, that there was a whole bunch of yeshivas and Jewish communities, and these have a national affair. Imagine if I told you there was a convention of all the Jewish communities, all the Orthodox Jewish communities, including the schools and everything else, including the schools. And let's say I'm just making some. They got together in uh, Atlantic City in this time, and they got together in uh, Florida at that time, right? Once a year here, you'd have a, a you know a, a, a convention of thousands of Jews. At that time, it was uh, Zaslav and Yaroslav, Bacharov, I read Lavav Lublin, but Shom Hay Rishul Sabachim Darm Sheyachol Lemoi Yeshiva Shiritz Lomasham, and that was switch off time. People who were learning in one Yeshiva, that's when you formally transferred to another Yeshiva. If that's what you wanted to do, so imagine the boardwalk. And then people walking around from OJ and from this yeshiva, and actually everybody's hocking to try to recruit people. Uh, you read Kama, Meis, Rosh Hashivas, Kama Lof, and Bachran. And at each one of these fairs, which were international business events, attended by not only Jews, but he's talking about the Jewish part, you had hundreds of Rosh Hashivas. And Alof and Bachran, and thousands of Yeshiva Bachran. But Kama Rivos, Narm, Estam, Yehudim. And tens of thousands of regular Jews, merchants and others, and plenty of non-Jews as well as many sands of the sea. So it was, like we would say today, it was a scene. It was a mob scene, right? In a positive way. Everybody came to the fair from all over the place. Like I said, you know, once a year, all the schools, all these shivas, all day schools, all the Jewish business guys, get, you know, I've never gone to these uh, food fairs. I hear the kosher big uh, food fairs are big deals, all the rest of it. 
Imagine at times a hundred, okay, or more, because today you have the chasidim, the whole business. That's what you used to have in Poland in the good days. That was the chasana place. In other words, what shidduchim, okay, because everybody was there. That's when the shidduchim were done. Kolechad mosheshon demi and zugo, because you got to find somebody. There's so many boys, so many girls, so many shachanim hawking around. You could just close your eyes and imagine this. Of Menasa Kama made a schitum, all you read and read, and hundreds of Shaduchim were made, a lot of them sometimes thousands were made, but when they saw Russian, Russian, the Hokkabi, a big the Malchus, and the Jews dressed up to the nines, um, so they were again, walking around like we say today, Bar Park, Ki Hoyu Hashum Bainia Malchus Bainia Gaim, because they were Hashav even in the eyes of the authorities, and, the, and they didn't mind it. When they saw Hoy Ram to Hoy Yom, and there was many, uh, as, a, as the sands of the sea, and now things are going bad. So that just gives you a glimpse of what was like the world was like in Yiddish land once upon a time. So I'm describing now, let's go to the next slide, an empire of Yiddish, which means this whole territory has Jews who are growing in number and speaking the same language. All these Jews, by the 1500s and afterwards, are speaking the same language. I can go from the extreme right hand, uh, you know, uh, at, at the extreme eastern part of Ukraine to the extreme western part of Latvia, it's the same Yiddish. It's an accent different, but it's the same Yiddish. So this is remarkable, okay? Um, there was even a Yiddish government. Um, let's go to the next one. This is called the Vada Baratzis, where all the communities get together. They were, the Jews were allowed to imitate the Polish parliament. That was a parliament of knights and nobles. So the Jewish communities used to send every year elected delegates to a national uh, Jewish parliament. That's where they decided the taxes and all kinds of other things. And so this was a chashva business. Big rabbis, rich people... You know, it wasn't a schlep operation at all. The opposite, all done in Yiddish. Okay? So when they negotiate with the government on behalf of how much taxes to pay, and when they issue takonos and uh, cherems and rules and regulations, it's in Yiddish. If you read this book, you can see, if you, you have to be able to understand the old-fashioned Yiddish to, 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 to translate it. And this empire described expanded in the early modern period. Let's go to the next one. And conquered, expanded into Hungary. Uh, if you see where it says uh, Poland, and right next to it, to the south of it, it would be the southwest. Both maps are the same. Hungary was much larger at that time than it is today. It's called the Kingdom of Hungary. The Kingdom of Hungary included Slovakia, Transylvania, you know, this, that, Slovenia, and so forth, whatever. And so it's a lot of, I beg your pardon, it's a lot of Jews, and they, the, the Polish Ashkenazic influence, Predominantly, Hungary too became a place of speaking Yiddish. So now look what a large map we're talking about now. It's the Holy Roman Empire, it's the Empire of Poland and Lithuania, and now it's the Kingdom of Hungary. All Yiddish speaking, okay? Now, um, I'm talking about a bigger linguistic country than uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, Sweden, and many other European countries. So Yiddish wasn't a little some ricky dinky business, but Yiddish was a lingua franca in a huge area, okay? And I want to remind you, in that time, it was both Yiddish and from. Uh, I'm not saying everybody was uh, keeping everything, but as a group, they were, okay? It was sufficiently from that Yiddish land would eventually, in the 1700s, produce the only mass movement of pietism in Jewish history. That's Hasidus, the modern Baal Shem Tov Hasidism. You know what I just said? That's a mass movement of people moving to the right, greater fundamentalism, machmer, greater nomianism, and everything else, which is what Hasidus has been. So Hasidism is an Ashkenazic, Yiddish, East European movement that just rose out of the intense Yiddishkeit, there I'm using that word, uh, that characterized that part of the world in those centuries. Uh, a Hasidic movement is a mass movement, never popped up among the Sephardim, the Italians, the Greek Jews, Persian Jews, and so on and so forth. It popped, and or the Yekis, right? It popped up uh, among the Yiddish-speaking Jews of Eastern Europe, as we all know. Now, um, Yiddish in the early modern period expanded even farther than what I just described. Not only to Eastern Europe, but not only to Hungary and all the rest of the Central Land, uh, but westward. Uh, Yiddish in the 1600s what I call a kabol kachpolto, the way it was uh, absorbed, the way it was spit out. Yiddish land grew again in the second half of the 1600s 
uh, when Polish Jewry, speaking Yiddish, re-entered Central and even Western Europe after the Thirty Years' War. So again, if you look at this map, uh, you see towards the right is Poland. The, uh, that's where all the Jews had run away to from Germany. Now some start moving back into Germany. So notice we'd be talking moving from the right map to the left. Back to the Holy Roman Empire and to Western Europe, places like the Netherlands and even England and, and so forth. So the Jews are re-entering Europe, and the Jews who are re-entering Europe are Yiddish speakers. This was due to a number of famous factors. Sure, I've talked about it in the past, but that doesn't mean you're going to be held responsible for this on the test. Uh, then, first of all, the new realities of the post-30 years war. Let's go to the next one. Uh, they're all the same, just uh, you see Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but then you see the part about Germany, which is uh, broken up to a bunch of different colors and funny-looking patchworks. That's what Germany had become, a bunch of little states, the Holy Roman Empire. And after 1648, it was each state for itself, and uh, therefore mercantilism kicked in, and every state wanted to build up its own little economy so it could have more taxes and therefore have a better army so they won't be swallowed up by the next state. And in that such a situation, and by the way, the country was depopulated, the Thirty Years' War was German against German, so they massacred each other uh, big time, and so you need population, you need especially people who could help the economy, and so the Germans in some cases were able to hold, were willing to hold their nose and allow some Jews coming in back from Eastern Europe, and uh, that started a flood just like you have today in America with the Hispanic. That's, that's what happened. Uh, so that's one reason, and number two, a reaction, let's go to the next slide, to Khmelnytsky. It is a very good book that came out recently that I recommend, uh, where uh, the Cossack massacres in 1640-69, and then the war continued for another 20 years. Because uh, the Russians invaded Poland without going into all the details, violence and slavery, because the uh, Muslims and the Russians used to take a lot of Jewish slaves, uh, resulted in, um, in tearing up Jewish life for a while in Poland. And some Polish Jews fled to Western Europe, okay? Um, in other words, they want to get out of there to escape the Cossacks. So that running away from the violence in Eastern Europe that was there at that time led to more Jews entering Central Europe, Germany, Hungary, um, believe it or not, France to some degree, Holland, and even England, okay? So what's the result? By the time you get to the late 1600s, Yiddish, for the first time, is not going to be spoken on the streets of London, Amsterdam, Paris, and beyond. Because you have new Jews moving in, Germany and Poland. And uh, now, I'm not talking about the Portuguese Jews. They're not going to speak Yiddish. In Holland, for example, everybody knows they had the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue. There they talk Portuguese. Right there they might talk Spanish. But a block or two away, whatever, will be the Ashkenazic synagogue. And there they're going to be talking Yiddish. Same thing in London. You might have the Bevis Marx synagogue, which will be Sephardic Portuguese. And they'll be doing their prayers in Portuguese and all that stuff. But a few blocks away would be the other synagogue, I think it was a Hambro or something like that, I forget. And that's a German, Ashkenaz, uh, you know, Polish uh, uh, show. And uh, believe you me, they're talking Yiddish over there. So um, Shakespeare was at the wrong time. All he knew about was the Merchant of Venice, there were no Jews in England his time. Had Shakespeare lived in a hundred years later, then he, Shylock, would have been talking Yiddish for all I know. Now, uh, this is an historical trend. A fecund uh, Eastern European Jewry, because they have so many babies over the next centuries, will provide Yiddish speakers to the rest of the world for the next 300 years, including my parents and probably many of your parents or grandparents or whatever, you know what I mean, right? Whoever from your family came over here, chances are the first ones came over to talk Yiddish and they all came from Eastern Europe in one context or another. Uh, this set of attitudes, what I call the perfect storm, the Polish willingness or, uh, you know, to let the Jews do their own thing, culturally. These attitudes will not change until the 1760s or so. So that means for 250 years, from let's say 1500 to 1750 approximately, Yiddish had a free ride in Eastern Europe. Okay? It was unchallenged. That's one big part of the story of Yiddish in the early modern period, in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. The second big story has to do with the new technology. In our lifetime, the new technology is the computers and the internet. At that time, the new technology, which characterized the early modern period and set it off from the Middle Ages, was the printing press. If you just use your imagination for a second, 
unless you have no imagination, and you can understand the radical change and difference having something called books printed uh, makes in, in all of culture, all of life. Now, publishing is capitalist. Would you agree with that? People do stuff to make money. And since there are among Jews in those centuries a lot more people who are Yiddish speaking and Yiddish reading, non-scholars, no, they can't read Hebrew, then there are scholars who can buy rabbinic texts in Hebrew. You understand what I'm saying? Suppose I want to publish a Sefer. I'm living 1550 or 1600. Let's say I'm a big Tamakacha. I'm the Marshal. He's a big one. Okay. So you publish a Sefer on the comments on the Gemara. Very nice. Very nice. Very chashub. No question about it. Very chashub. Who can read it? Who's your market? How many copies do you expect to sell? You get my point? You're a peer on Septus Creases or something, I guess, right? Pay you sure. Who, who are you writing for? It's got to be people who can read Hebrew, and as you know, know how to learn. And actually, to read the Marshall, Pay you sure. You got to know how to learn, learn. It's a very small market. So you publish these things not for commercial reasons. The Marshall didn't write the Marshall. The Beis Yosef didn't write the Beis Yosef to make money. They did it, Lahabdil Torah Lahadir, maybe for fame. You know, to have a piece in the pantheon of uh, rabbinic literature. All very chashem and all very great. Look at all the famous names I just mentioned. The Ramah, the Machaber, the Shach, the Taz, this, that, and the other. No question about it. They didn't do it to make money. Because it, it's, it's not a big seller if you talk to me dollars and cents. You know, if my CPA sits down with me and he says, you know, how many of these are you going to sell? Because there's a limited market. Now, I'm going to contrast that with the following. Suppose I write something in Yiddish. Right? Those are in a Bubba Mice in Yiddish. Um, but I'm good at it. It's, a, it's an interesting book. It's a big crowd. The numbers are incredibly bigger. How many people out there in the Jewish community can read Hebrew, especially rabbinic Hebrew? And then how many can read Yiddish? The answer is everybody can read Yiddish, because that was language spoken, and a relatively small number, sometimes a tiny number, can read Hebrew. You see where I'm going. So if I'm, for whatever reason, deciding, you know, I'd like to make a living or maybe a side income in publishing Jewish stuff. You know, <laughs> what is my wife going to tell me to go into? Uh, publishing Hebrew or publishing Yiddish? If my point is to make money. i got kids to marry off, i got bills to pay, whatever it is. What am I doing? What, you know, what, what am I doing? If I sell something Yiddish, it's a big market. If I sell something Hebrew, uh, it's a much smaller market. So, since publishing is capitalist, and since there are among the Jews a lot more Yiddish-speaking, Yiddish-reading non-scholars, then there are scholars who buy rabbinic texts in Hebrew. There was existentially a lucrative market for all kinds of books in Yiddish, right? As a result, the early modern era sees an explosion of books in Yiddish. Uh, that's characteristic of it. Now, it didn't happen in the Middle Ages because there's no uh, printing press. Okay? There's no incentive, let's put it this way, to, to, to write and publish anything other than the people used to write, you know, copy out manuscripts and one from the other. Uh, but that's a much economically retarded kind of activity. Publishing in, in a book, you can make a lot of money if you know what you're doing. So Yiddish, as a result, in the early modern era, becomes a culture with a rich literature, which is the sign of a great culture. This will be part of the strange profile of Yiddish, which will baffle and exasperate its critics, those who look down upon it as a jargon and a patois, Something not worthy of respect. Yiddish, it's not real German. It's a knockoff. Weird words make up the, they violate the rules of German grammar, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, really? I got news for you. This jargon, as you call it, jargon, has a richer literature produced over the course of many centuries than many so called national cultures in Eastern Europe and the Third World. They got nothing back in those years, maybe a poem or two, and we got tons of titles because the Jews were highly literate. Right? Uh, to use modern terminology, you need something to read on Shabbos afternoon. Not everybody is so pious and learned they're going to sit on Shabbos afternoon and learn their Barashah. Listen, all power to them. Hats off. That's a great Talmud Chacham. I have the highest admiration for a person who can learn the Gemara with the Barashah on Shabbos afternoon. Friday night, long nights. I have the greatest, everyone had, everyone had the greatest respect for them. Very few. Right? What about the kids, the regular people, the women, and all the rest? What, what are they going to read? On Friday afternoon. There's no Mishpacha at that time. It's no Ami. What are you going to do? You see? The phenomenon of Yiddish literature is going to make it a funny kind of dialect as it will contain 
a surfeit of egghead intellectuality, as we shall see. But first, in the early modern period, came a different type of Yiddish literature. Right at the beginning of Jewish printing, which is in the 1500s, centered in Italy. So as you can see, there's the original Gemara's, published by Bromberg. You get one of these and you're a rich man, baby. Right? If you get a whole set, you're a multi-zillionaire. But even if you get one copy from the real, because the church burned most of them, you know, they're rare. Uh, they invented so-called Surah Sadaf, that people now consider holy. These are not Jews. Uh, so it's the Gemara in the middle and the Rashi Tos on the side. So Italy is the headquarters where they actually had printing press. What do I mean printing press? Let's get very physical. i got to have something where somebody made an olive, a base, right? That you can put on the page. Those were rare. If you want to get Latin characters, A, B, C, D, you had more of them in Europe. Not a ton, but more of them. They're all over the place because Europe is a Latin-speaking language. Uh, you know, language zone, correct? England, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, you all have the same, uh, you know, Latin alphabet. Now, where do you get your olive, your base, let alone your nakudos or something like that? There weren't many. So somebody had to physically make them and they had to be decent. If it's this way, you need two types of fonts, don't you? You need uh, square printing and Rashi script, don't you see? Who's got all that? And the answer is, it was originally Italy. And now I'm going to tell you a story that you do not know. A story of a two-tiered Jewish culture, Jewish literary culture. You only know one tier, because that's the tier that gets the attention in the um, from world. I mean, the non from world, without, with the exception of a few academics, is ignorant of all this and considers it irrelevant. But I'm sp speaking to you who are watching this, then probably, I assume, or uh, remember more or less of what we call broadly speaking from world. Oh, the only t tier you know about, the only tier that gets the attention um, in the modern Orthodox world, which is the yeshiva culture, that's all they know. That culture is classicist. Um, by classicist, I mean rabbinic scholarship. And it's in Hebrew, the rabbinic Hebrew. So you look at the art school book, the Rishon of the Early Achronim, for example. It's a very nice book. It's got a lot of famous rabbis in there and what they wrote. So it's good for literary history. It is. I recommend it to people. Nobody in Yiddish. <laughs> it's all guys that wrote stuff in Hebrew. Well, there any commentary in the Talmud, uh, the Halakha, uh, the responsa, maybe a poet or two. I don't think so, but maybe. Well, in the Middle Ages for sure. It's all Hebrew. It's classicist. You understand? Um, there's nobody writing a, a, a Yiddish novel you want to find it over there. Beneath the dignity of the art scroll. You understand? Those are popular uh, kind of uh, uh, literature. We're talking about Chashua literature. And our society, the one you and I live in today, is one which only commemorates and gives memory to the Hebrew rabbinic classics of the earlier period. Let's go to the next one. So indeed, those we give a lot of attention to. Here I just picked at random. Uh, obscure technical rabbinic classics are constantly printed. So the shoe was in a Maram Lublin. I mean, I know it is, you know. And uh, Truma's Edition is actually an ancestor. Right? You know, these are, uh, the believe me, they're very technical classics, but they were printed all the time because they're classicist. The rabbinic literature, and great rabbinic literature, and the Hebrew ones are responsive. They're both kind of responsive. Now, um, these are the books that get reprinted. Ask someone, even someone knowledgeable, about Jewish literature in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. They will tell you about famous Rabbanim. True? Let's go to the next one. Who are big guys? Well, there's a Yosekar, there's an Ed Behuda, for example. These are names people into. That's the Abishas at the bottom. Mm -hmm. On the right hand side is uh, Prichash. What am I talking about? Rabbis who wrote books in Hebrew of rabbinic scholarship. Get it? Um, I repeat, how many people have ever heard of certainly can read the pre Chodesh? Who knows what it is? You see my point? No, no, no. In an elitist culture such as the Shiva culture, what do you mean? I know four guys in Baltimore that can read the pre Chodesh. That's already a lot. The classicist Hebrew literature is where all the egghead stuff took place in the early modern period. Say we have something like the Maral of Prague on the left hand side, or the Ramchal of Lutzat on the right hand side. If they write um, intense intellectual topics of, uh, as they say, egghead, you know, spirituality, Kabbalah, machshava, abstract uh, aspects of Judaism. It's in Hebrew. You get it? But now, 
Let's raise the following question. How many of you can read these books? How many can understand them in the slightest? Especially in the original. I mean, how many could you could read it without art scroll or other translations or aids? The answer is none. Right? Or am I wrong? Right? Now, so did Jewish culture exist as a phenomenon that was beyond the reach of at least 90% of the Jewish population in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s? Could it exist that way? I'm raising an important cultural question. Could we have Judaism today without the cheater books? Right? Isn't that what you use? Usually? Most of the time? The answer is no. For sociological reasons and others, a secondary literature is a vital necessity. Not the primary literature that I've been talking about for the last two minutes. The rabbinics, the scholarship, the, the, the heavy works of classicism. A secondary literature is necessary. Today, in the world that you and I inhabit, secondary literature is in English, or French, or Spanish, or Russian. Look, here's a Russian um, sitter or whatever, art school sitter in Russian. Uh, more power to them. It's great. Because they're not going to understand Hebrew. Maybe, with the help of the Russian translation, a Ruski can understand the Hebrew after a while. Get it? But you couldn't do it without it. Let's be honest. Now, in the case of the Jews, in those centuries, the secondary literature was mostly in Yiddish, and this was a vital factor in Jewish life at the Hamon Am level. Okay? Because otherwise they wouldn't know anything about Judaism. They couldn't, couldn't access or crack the books. And we are a culture of books, right? What is the Jude Jewish religion without the books? Let's start by, uh, so in other words, when we look at Yiddish literature <coughs> published in the early modern period, we're looking at real social history. You show me a book that was published at that time, that's what the public read. Don't tell me, oh, how could the public read this? Uh, this is Narshka, this is, or this is our rated, or this and the other. That's what people read. That's called social history. That's the real thing that was going on. Let us start by identifying several types of literature published in Yiddish in these centuries. The earliest type, you'll be surprised at this, would be Geisha romances. <laughs> okay? Soap operas. So here we have one of the most famous figures of uh, late medieval and early modern um, literature. The legendary Sir Bevis of Hampton uh, from England. He's a lion slayer, as you can see on the left. A giant tamer, as you can see on the right. With Choisvian, the damsel in distress. Oh my goodness. This was translated... Stories about him were translated in, in, in dozens of languages. Okay? Now, it was not only dozens of languages, nothing Jewish about this whatsoever. It was also translated in Yiddish. It's called Bova de Antona, Sir Bevis of, of Hampton. By the time the Italians finished, it's Bova de Antona. Right? And uh, it's the whole book. It's a couple hundred pages. Now, uh, you say, what kind of story is this for a Jewish uh, ask the mashkiach, ask the rabbi Yishol, could you read one of these things? I've got news for you. This is what your bubby's bubby's bubby read long ago on Shabbos afternoon. Listen, to Solik Hotcakes. Here's the story in brief. Bubba's young mother conspired, this is the Yiddish version of the story. Bubba's young mother conspires to have her husband, an aged king, killed during a hunt, then marries the murderer. They try and fail to poison the child Bubba, whom they are afraid will avenge his father. The handsome youth runs away from Antona, is kidnapped and taken to Flanders to be a stable boy to a king whose daughter, Tuzan, Shuazan, falls in love with him. The heathen sultan of Babylonia arrives, backed by 10,000 warriors, to demand Tuzan in marriage for his ugly son, Lucifer. He is refused, it's all in Yiddish. He is refused. In the ensuing war, the king of Flanders is captured. Bovo, riding the magic horse, Pamela, and wielding the magic sword, Rondella, defeats the sultan's army, slays Lucifer, Frees the king and is promised the hands of Druzan, but is enticed to Babylonia where he is horribly imprisoned for a year before escaping. Meanwhile, Druzan has presumed him dead and consented to marry the knight Macabron. On the wedding day of Druzan and Macabron, Bobo arrives disguised as a beggar. He and the Kala flee, first to a palace and later to a forest. Pursued by Macabron, deep in the forest, she gives birth to twins. Bobo sets off to find a route back to Flanders. Druzan comes to the conclusion he's fallen prey to a lion. Sets off on her own with her twins, successfully reaches Flanders. Bubba returns to their forest abode, failing to find her twins. He now presumes to fall in prey, knows that they're dead. Despairing, he joins an army raged against his native Antona. He kills his stepfather, 
dispatches his mother to a nunnery and takes his rightful crown. He is eventually reunited with Jerusalem and becomes his queen. This is what you read on Friday night. Is there anything Jewish in this? <laughs> right? Basically, this is like one of these uh, TV series or something like that, Greek. Uh, you can think of many parallels, I imagine. Uh, days of our lives. Give me a break. <laughs> this is beyond days of our lives. This was all the hot cakes. You know what? Your kids, whether you like it or not, they read Harry Potter and all the junk. Sure or not. So, it's in Yiddish. You see? It's in Yiddish. Um, and by the way, this story became so popular and was so printed over and over again that ever since then, if you hear somebody say, where did you hear that tall tale? It's a Bubba Misa, not a Bubba Misa. <laughs> right? Now I feel like Paul Harvey. Because everybody read the Bubba Misa. Bubba being Bobo, Sir Bevis of Hampton. Okay? Now, is this Jewish? Clearly, the telling of it in Yiddish deemed it Jewish in some fashion. At least, that's what Elio Bachert said. He was a famous Jewish intellectual. Not a rabbi, but a big expert in Dictuk and things like that. And uh, in Italy and Germany, uh, he knew a lot of famous Christian intellectuals. And he, comp by the way, he wrote the first uh, Hebrew Yiddish dictionary. That tells you a lot. Hebrew Yiddish dictionary. Here? Uh, and he translated this and some other of these type of tales. And I'm sure the guy laughed all the way to the bank. And why not? Because the public likes it. Does what the island built. There were other examples during these centuries of these kinds of reworked Gaisha soap opera novels that were published over the next centuries. The rabbis didn't like them, but they sold anyway. <laughs> okay? I'll say it again. Go to the rabbi of your local Gudashul and say, Can I read Harry Potter on Shabbos? What? Can I read Harry Potter during the week? <laughs> yeah. Let alone this other stuff. I mean, I don't even know the science fantasy jump. Then came a, so that's one type of, so just understand, all the way during the 1500s, the 1600s, 1700s, people were translating and publishing these things, and they sold. And they sold. Then came another genre of Yiddish books, which is actually the most popular genre of them all. These are books, uh, not of Yiddish, but of Yiddish kite. Okay? They're books about Judaism and Yiddish. Uh, these really were even bigger sellers. These played the role that English firm books play in our culture in America today. You have art school books in them, you have Feldheim, you have this kind of stuff. Do you? They make accessible the literature and the content of rabbinic literature to an audience who cannot read the Hebrew text. This is the majority of the Jewish people. Hence, these books were of enormous value. Go to any shul, unless everybody is not very learned. Look on the walls, there's lots of stuff in English. Am I right or am I wrong? Not just translations. All kinds of Jewish books in English. Go to the bookstore. And since these are widely read, and are often the only way for the masses to access the Jewish ideas, Jewish texts, the art school is not simply translating, but they control the culture. Because they choose what to translate, and how to translate it, and to give it a twist. Which is why the left-wingers, I just picked it, I picked this article off the internet, that's all. Left-wingers don't like art school. Walk into a room, women's prayer group in Ramah school, board member at a Jewish Orthodox Feminine Line, saw about a dozen copies of, of the art school women's sitter, and uh, she knew a review, and the uh, Jofa Journal said, that, uh, it emphasizes the least women must do to fill their obligation of praying, discourage them from doing more, and she's all angry about it. And she begins the third paragraph, this is not the approach of one for young women or schools, and it's become a big boss mitzvah gift. You see what I just said? She said, from the left wing perspective, for Hashim bin Jovah, this is the wrong message. But son of a gun, everybody's buying the art and giving it for a gift. That's what I mean when I say, whoever's publishing is dominating the culture. Uh, the organization at the beginning of the latest pair of Recirculate 50 minutes review warning art school sitter. <laughs> get it? Don't get the art school sitter. Let's go to the next page. Uh, it's inappropriate in the top line for modern Orthodox institution. Encouraging women in prayer. Uh, the warning hasn't impacted sales at a sitter, said Rabbi Sherman, from the Archival General Editor. There's no point in responding. They're entitled to their opinion. We don't, we don't agree. The art school was founded by Rabbi Sherman and so on and so forth. They put together a nicely uh, packaged thing. And uh, look at towards the bottom. Love them or leave them or loathe them. It seems everyone familiar with art school religious books has strong opinions about it. And so on and so on and such and such. That is a left-wing article. My point, though, is 
They're not wrong. Everybody knows the article is a Haredi type thing. And so if you have a shul that's going to get articles up, it's going to be a Haredi perspective. You say, wait a minute, translations are transparent. They're just telling me what it says in the books. Not true. What you choose to translate, how you choose to translate, which word yes, in and out, that makes a big difference. This is not a nefarious plot, Pache, the uh, left-wingers. Arts will discover what the oil wants. Is a capitalism, right? It's like Walt Disney. You publish this in this type of book, it'll sell well. You publish another one, it won't. Uh, now, same thing centuries ago. I'm not saying that nobody could read Hebrew. They could. But there were massive Hebrew sources and commentaries out there, and not circulating much, particularly in those centuries. And there was no base Yaakov movement or, you know, day, day school movement where at least people were exposed, I don't know how successfully, to reading Hebrew in the original. And so there are massive sources out there. A good, efficient anthology of these in Yiddish would find a market of interested readers. And such anthologies did. What I'm talking about is the constant desire for a good presentation of information in a clear manner. Look, a lot of people nowadays can read, let's say, Hilchah Shabbos stuff. Because we have day schools and yeshivas afterwards. They can read Hilchah Shabbos stuff in the original. There are many people out there who study um, individually, or Chavrusas, at Kizir Shulchan Aruch, at Chayyaram, even Mishnah Bura, and so forth. There are many classes, online resources, and yet, in spite of what I just said, people will buy an art school book, a Feldheim book, on the subject of Hilchah Shabbos, if it is presented clearly and efficiently. Do you not disagree? Do you agree with me? Do you not agree with me? There. So, let's go to the next one. Don't a lot of people have the article of laws of Shabbos in the book? Why don't you go look at a Mishnah book? It's presented well. It's presented well. It's easy. I look up something on Shabbos, I have a question. It's right there. It's in English. You see my point? In the early modern period, the outstanding example of a book produced for this capitalist market, a book which sold amazingly, was the book that became the icon for all pre-modern Yiddish literature, and I'm of course referring to the Senoretta. Let's go to the next one. All right? The famous book on the Chumash, which was, there's an iconic picture. Instant commercial success, the Senoretta was republished 250 times, if not more. Hear what I just said? So would you call that a successful capitalist enterprise or not? Now, this, what is it, Senorena? I'm going to tell you something. It's not what you think. This was a Yiddish explanation of the Parsha of the Week, including the Haftorah and also including the Megillahs. In other words, this book is totally practical and is intended to be Ma'ochim Rashiv, a person which is able to learn about the Parsha of the Week in Yiddish in a simple way. In effect, the author, who was an unknown Polish rabbi, who clearly was a big Talmud Chacham and knew a belt. I mean, not only Shas and Poskin, but a lot of other you know, sources, Mepharshim and so forth. No question about it. Machshava, philosophy. A certain rabbi composed a Chumash commentary of his own. So it's like Chumash with Tenorena. As if he were a Rashi. There's the Chumash and his commentary in Yiddish, which he called Tenorena, which is, of course, taken... From, uh, let's go to the next one. The famous Pusik in Song of Songs. Santa Rena Benosi Amabel Shlomo. Batora Shetli Mobil Chasin also. Go out, young women of Zion, and gaze at Shlomo Melch, wearing the crown his mother placed on him on the day of his wedding, the day of his heart's rejoicing. So Santa Rena means I'm addressing to the women. Benos Sio. So the title is like that. But what do you have? There's the Chumash and his commentary in Yiddish, which he called it Santa Rena. His commentary is an anthology of other commentaries and sources, but it's a selection of them. He picked the ones he thought would be the most interesting, relevant, perhaps Mosheikh, uh, practical to the reader, and he reworked them all himself in Yiddish. It's not just a collection of other people's stuff. It's not just a bunch of quotes. It's him you're reading. This Polish rabbi weaving together, picking and choosing, paraphrasing, using nice Yiddish words that are touchy feely and make you feel good all over. Uh, but it's the author of the anthologizer you're reading, so it flows. It's not choppy, it's a unitary work. So, me, if I, me, myself, and I, 
were writing my own commentary in the Chumash, like I, for example, do my podcast, I'd be saying my own way of understanding Rashi or Ramban or whoever it is, right? Or, you know, Yonas uh, and Amshas. It would be me talking. Therefore, you get a unitary work. And if I was good at it, you'd like it. The only thing is, oh, let me put it this way. The guy did exactly what Rashi did in the 10 hundreds, 500 years earlier. And therefore, his book, the Tenorena, enjoyed the same kind of popularity for centuries that Rashi did. So you talk about Chumash Rashi, no question about it. Chumash Rashi is classicist, it's in Hebrew. The Tenorena, not classicist, but it was just as popular, if not more. That's quite a statement I just made, right? Uh, Rashi had lived in the ten hundreds before other Roshonim and Mepharshim. He was early one in the Middle Ages. So obviously Rashi, if you know anything about all about Rashi and Chumash, is an anthology primarily from earlier you know, Chazal, once in a while, uh, you know, a, a, a somewhat earlier contemporary, Moshe Darshan. But that's what it is. But Rashi isn't just giving you, you know, bullet points and I'm sharing with you Chazals. He puts it in his own words. Therefore, you end up with a unitary document. That's why, and Rashi was a very good writer. That's why people like it. That's what this guy did in Yiddish. Okay? So the author of Tenorena lived 500 years later. So he had an ocean of commentary literature upon which to draw. Just like Rashi, the Chazals, the Gemaras, the Midrashim. The Rishonim, Rashi, Ramban, Ibn Ezra, uh, Rabbah, Ben Abachaya, told us Yitzhak, which was recent. All kinds of uh, things out there. And he takes a word from here and a word from there and so on and so forth. And he reworks it all in Yiddish. The trick, of course, is to draw well. Not, from, not to choose boring stuff. And don't choose stuff that's too abstract or philosophical, which loses a mass audience. They want a nice part on the Parsha. Not, I said that wrong. They want a nice explanation of the parsha of the week. Right? But I want to be clear over here, contrary to popular opinion, the center in it was by no means a dummy book. Just meant for uneducated viber, as they used to think. On the contrary, if you had the original, anybody today could read the center in the parsha of the week, and you can learn a lot. Okay? It's a highly intelligent work. It's not what you think. Right? It's presented well. It's not for dumbbells. It's presented well. Uh, and all I can tell you is, it was a supernova among the women. And it became an iconic symbol of the true woman of old. Because there really was no Jewish home that didn't have a senoretta, which is read on Shabbos by the women. Right? These are typical scenes, photographs, paintings. You can multiply this a thousand times over. Uh, but you get the wrong opinion, because this looks like somebody's bubby. You see it? You say, yeah, but she has no better and all the rest of it. It's not true. Okay? It is how the mothers, the grandmothers and the daughters uh, learned the Parsha of the week and knew it. The Parsha with a very nice collection of classical sources. So you see, here's a lady. She now went to yeshiva. and went to day school. There was no formal education for girls. She knows the Rashi. She knows a, 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 a famous Ramban. She knows the famous Ralbog. She knows, how do you know this all? Where'd you get it from? Put the center around it. So what's wrong with doing it that way? With the fact that she read it in Yiddish that makes it dumb? It's the same Ramban. You don't know the Ramban, and she knows the Ramban. Get it? Or, you know, or the Balaturim or whoever it is. You follow? So the female was not formally educated, but she could be very knowledgeable thanks to this monument of what I would call Jewish middle brow culture. Um, which is a very important phenomenon. Uh, and we have it in the Orthodox Jewish world today, middle brow literature. When I was a kid, and you went into the supermarket, as you went to pick up, you know, at, at the cashier, it's all kind of books. You old enough to remember this? I'm not talking about the National Enquirer and all that junk. They used to have uh, science books, history books. I remember as a kid, I bought a bunch of encyclopedias, art all kind of stuff like that. Now, what does that mean? Middle brow culture. They're trying to share the elements of high culture, elements of high culture, in a way that can be appreciated by the homono and by the masses. So, so what? When I was a kid, I didn't have a PhD in history. What's wrong with learning about the Civil War? I don't know, whatever else, from a book that I picked up at the, uh, at the uh, you know, supermarket. You get it? There were lots of books of this type which popularized and try to share the results of science and, and uh, academic scholarship with a wider audience, with a much wider audience. I'm not a math and science person, but what if somebody had 
you know, was interested in science. I have friends like this, and they picked up a wealth of knowledge about science when they were very young from these types of books. Okay? Um, without middle brow culture, you have a big problem in your hands, which is why America's in Gehopta Tzorah right now, because what I just described no longer exists. You go to supermarkets, they're not selling encyclopedias or history books, they're selling National Enquirer, who the heck knows what else. Uh, we have an unbelievably dumbed down uh, population today, as we all know, and uh, they're at the mercy of wh whoever they encounter on the internet. I mean, the, the, it's, a, it's a sad story. You do have an elite of educated people with educations and a scholarship, but it's a tiny group. The culture is in crisis in America today because it's only a tiny group. You haven't been able to share the elements of that with the mass population. I want to be clear, plenty of men read the Cenerento. It's a great cheater book. It's a great work of popular Middlebrow culture. There was no demand in those centuries for a straightforward translation of the Bible into Yiddish. Isn't that interesting? There was a couple that published it, Goyim, a Christians in Switzerland, and place like that, and issued a translation, you know, straightforward translation. You don't have this academic sense. I want to know what the word means. People were very from in their attitudes, and, you know, I want to know what the Parsha of Shua means as refracted through the mediation of our classic sources. Okay? Now, uh, Here's where gender politics, in my opinion, enters the picture. It's in the nature of scholars to look askance on middle-brow culture. Mm -hmm. It's not really right. You know, the, the, the public thinks they know something. We know. We read the journals. We read the academic articles. We wrote the academic articles. They only know something, you know, popular. Um, elitists. Elites are elitist. Which can be disgusting. Jewish elites can be particularly disgusting. Which, of course, is how the Baal Shem Tov started, right? Uh, because the really Hasidic movement, as everybody knows, was a strident critique against the elitism of the rabbinical scholars. Okay? Uh, and he wasn't wrong about that. Most scholars, Tamil Chachamim, who could read the sources in the original, felt it was part of the elit elitism to put down the middle brow books, including all books written in Yiddish. Hey, Yiddish is just for women. This is always the uh, conservative Stan Pattison uh, in recent times. When the art school of Gemara first came out, and I used to write for that, it had meetings, and they would say, oh, all the Rebbe's in the schools are attacking, criticizing the art school of Gemara, but really they have them themselves at home. <laughs> you see? This is how, go, oh, you're reading English. Oh, you're reading with the kudos. Oh, you're reading this, you're reading that. Wait a minute. So I'm reading, what's wrong? At least I know it. No, 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 you should only read in the classic. What if I don't know from the classic? Well, they don't know it. That's stupid. That's always the same point of the elites. The Yish literature is a protest against that. You understand? The truth is, this is disgusting in general. So what if it's, so what if it's written for the women? Which it wasn't. Let's say it was written for the women. What does it say when the Torah was given? First came to women. You're not going to have a Jewish religion or Jewish anything without the women. Okay? Thanks to them... These critics, these elitists, the center ran got what I would call a bad reputation, or better yet, a patronizing reputation. They would make a man not a woman to be seen uh, uh, reading it. That stinks. In later eras, 19th, early 20th century, the non frum would deploy this kind of discourse to diss the entire culture of Jewish piety. Oh, is it center ran Right? They would immortalize stupid jokes. I knew them all. They said, this never happened. He said, a Jewish lady of yesteryear is reading the Tenorano, and she's piously, and she's reading the story of Joseph, which she reads every year. And the father tells Joseph, Yaakov tells Joseph, go visit your brothers. And she said, don't go! <laughs> They'll kill you! Right? It's a funny story. It's not true. It's part of the Jewish cultural politics, in which the left-wingers, these are caricatur caricatures uh, written by uh, jerks, not realities. All these caricatures are bogus, that's what I'm telling you today. The Jewish women were just as intelligent as the men. As a matter of fact, if you want to get down to it, many, many businesses in Europe were run by smart women married to incompetent husbands. Uh, it's a very famous Ashkenazic uh, trope. These women were smart and also pious. And they're the ones who enabled Ashkenazic Jewry to flourish century after century. Maybe you've heard of the famous Glickel of Hamlin, who left a very uh, a brilliant and intelligent uh, autobiography. She's a classic example of the successful Jewish... But this woman ran a big business, okay? Because her husband died, she had to run the whole thing. 
So she was able to hand over the successful business to her kids. You follow? So she reads, she's Yiddish speaking. She reads the Tenorena. Do we consider her, you know, some, some dummy? Okay. And very often, it was the well-to-do women who supported the yeshivas and the kolos. Uh, look at the next one. The Marsha is called Marsha, or Shlomo Eagles. Edel, Eidi, is his mother-in-law. Why did he call himself Shlomo, the son-in-law of so on and so forth? Why didn't he call him by his parents' name? His mother-in-law bankrolled the whole operation. She enabled the Marsha to be a Marsha. She paid for the yeshiva, for the boys that room and board, for the three meals a day, and so on and so forth. So those without her, she, and there were many cases like this in the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s of these well-to-do women who became great patrons of learning and of Torah institutions. So the author of the Tenorena was not writing a book for barefoot dumbbells. He was successful precisely because he composed a book for an intelligent audience, a pious audience to be sure, who would sit in the Ezra's Russian and perhaps maybe had to stay home and couldn't go to shul because he had small kids in the house, who wouldn't know about Parshas Baloska this week in an intelligent way, I repeat, in an intelligent way. And they wondered about the Haftorah too, and let me tell you something, there's plenty of learning guys they don't have jack about the Haftorah. <laughs> I'm asking you right now, be honest, you can't even tell me what the Haftorah is this week, you see? And so you're making fun of somebody who knows what the Haftorah is because they read it in the Yiddish and the center right? uh, You can know, what's wrong with that? Anyway, as I said, the book was reprinted more than 200 times, 250 times, if not more. And uh, I just have to warn you, I don't get any money from this, most of the uh, reprints are faulty. They cut out stuff, they added stuff. There's a whole story to that. But you don't get the real Tanarena by a lot of what you read, including the art school, by the way. This around, uh, it's a truncated the part of the Tanarena. It doesn't give you the full business, any of the uh, richness of it. Uh, there's a new scholarly edition by a professor. That's the next one. Those are interested in, for every reason from Professor Firestein who's a big scholar, conservative rabbi, uh, they put a lot of time and effort in this to getting the full business in English, if you care about that. But my point, now let's move away from one uh, particular uh, text, although it was hugely successful, can Judaism survive without middle-brow culture? I ask you that question. Can Judaism survive without all those English books and shopsies? <laughs> okay. I don't think so. Because the ones that can read the Hebrew are very few. Okay. Now, to my mind, by the way, the success, the commercial success, and the Jewish success, because here we're talking about raising the knowledge level of the Hamun Am, of the average person out there, the Balabatim, the Balabustas, the kids. You make a, the Chumash, which is so much a part of who we are, uh, knowledgeable, accessible. The success of the Senorena in the early 1600s led, I think, to the Sephardic Jews in the Ottoman Empire producing a similar kind of work, but in Ladino, because they didn't speak Yiddish, that, of course, would be the next slide. That's your Mayim Lois. Right? What is Mayim Lois? It's the same thing. The author, very famous rabbi, Kuli, big Tom Chacham, goes and, and, and surveys the same. So I'm telling you right now, I think Ari Kaplan made the Mayim Lois uh, you know, known and popular. If you get the Mayim Lois today, you go to the Parsha, you know a lot. I'll tell you right now. Uh, people say, hey, man, Lois, uh, that's a stupid. Don't get blocked by these elite dumbbells. You know, they're, they're, they're getting in the way of everything. Anyway, that's the story of Yiddish. I've spoken about the, um, the Tenorena at length because it was the bestseller and the best known. But there were similar books that came out all the time. Nach, to, te to tell a story about Shmuel. The Shmuel book, tell you about the stories of Shmuel. Uh, the uh, Mlochem book, tell you stories, the history in Mlochem. So you know what's flying in the Nach. Moser books, Halacha books, here's a, a, a famous one from yesteryear, Eine Schönen Frauen Buchlein. <laughs> a very nice little book for women. Seder Mitzvah Noshim, which is about um, women's Halachas, uh, Chala, Anita, uh, Halachas Neiris, that sort of thing. Written by a girl. Uh, uh, Damascus bin Yaman, the famous pose. But he said, listen, my responses are for a few of my colleagues. Not too many people out there can read Damascus bin Yaman. But my wife, my daughters, my, my, my friends, and all the rest, of it, I want to help them. And so he'll put out something Yiddish, and it was also a bestseller for a long time, save for Mitzvah Nashim. Uh, here, look at the next one. Here's a popular book from yesteryear written by a woman, a Rebetzin, called uh, The Mehnekes Rivka. 
Look at the, this is very contemporary. It's in Yiddish. It's written by a woman for a woman. So what are the chapter headings? Ashar Rishon. Eich tzricha o'isha. This is a Hebrew translation. Eich tzricha o'isha l'isna heg. How is a woman supposed to behave? Eich t'shak t'kashe t'skufo. And to adorn herself, to dress and so forth. Kedesh and nishmos lo tabe. Not to lose in a shama. In other words, deportment, hygiene, um, cleanliness, and so on and so forth. Hashar Hashani, next one. Eich isha tzricha l'isna heg in bailo. How should you live with her husband? This is uh, advice for how to get along with a husband. They should live with a chavah, take a life. The third one, how to get along im horel, with your parents. How do you treat your parents once you're married? The fourth one, how to get along with your in-laws. Listen, you know and I know. You could <laughs> you could stand reading this book. There's a few lessons you either learn the hard way or, or not. What is the next one? Raising kids. What are the tips out there for raising kids? To raise them for Taramais and Tobu. The sixth one. How to get along with your daughter-in-law. With your son-in-law. Again, you can learn the hard way and pay the price or read the book. And it says in the front, it's written by Rebison. And finally, the last one. How do you run your household? People in your house. And it's very practical. It's not the rumble. It's not Tosis. It's very practical. And it's, again, it's all like hotcakes. Or you can have books. There's Josephus in Yiddish. Or Yosef fun to be more exact. This guy who looks like the Emperor Maximilian of Habsburg. That's supposed to be Titus, or I don't know who it was. Julius Caesar. You know, uh, and, it's, and, and this is Yiddish in Frankfurt. Look at the bottom. Frankfurt, right? Uh, if you, people can read Yosef in Hebrew. They can read it in Yiddish. Uh, in other words, the whole gamut of stuff other than Gamar, Gamar, Gamar. In some respects, the most striking of all this type of literature were the Tchinos. What? These are private prayers written in Yiddish. I would call them the, um, the Piyutim of the early modern era. Uh, as you perhaps know, uh, depending on what show you go to, we have a lot of Piyutim out there that were composed after the Seder came out. Uh, before the Rishonim, during the Rishonim, and so forth, Piyutim, a lot of what you say are not the original sitter. They're religious poems that become part and parcel of the liturgy in some places. Uh, the Sephardim have theirs, the Ashkenazim have theirs. Piyutim are Hebrew, they're classicists, they're wonderfully poetic. If you can read the words, I guarantee you right now 99% can't understand the words, especially with Ashkenazic poetry, because they're obscure. If it's from Kaliri, they're deliberately obscure. You got to know the the the, you know Talmudic or Midrashic reference it was meant to be like a chidas um, By contrast, but but what does the piyutim represent? It's my own native religious feeling. You know the Shema doesn't do it for me. The Shema Nesri doesn't do it for me. I'll say it. You know I don't mind saying the Ashrei. I say it every day. The guy says I say it every day, Bar Shama, but it doesn't do it for me. I want to have my own personal expression of how I'm talking to God. These are the great Pythonists of the past. There's nothing in there, for example, to represent the, the, what we lost in the Crusades, so we're going to write keynotes about the Crusades. There's nothing in there to represent, you know, how we suffer in this place and that place, and we want to write something that expresses that, and so forth. Uh, the tri- they're in Hebrew, in fancy Hebrew. The trimes are in Yiddish. Uh, sometimes they're written uh, by women and for women, Rasa, they're written by men. What kind of person be trimes? What I just said before. The chinos you can understand, they're written in Yiddish, and they're very plain. Oh Lord, help, help my family, and raise my kids, kids that they should want to grow up and be from, and want to learn, and my daughter should have a chasana, and we should do this, and God keep us in mind when you're giving out your brachas. That's plain talk. You know what I'm saying? I know what I'm saying. It hits you in the gut. You understand? It hits you in the gut. The way the regular davening, especially when the Hebrew doesn't. So, it's basically, uh, as you can see over here, Here's a sitter from yesteryear. The top is regular sitter stuff. At the bottom is a different chinus. This particular one, chinus from Rosh Chodesh Benson, um, was written by uh, the greatest, I would say, of the Tachina composers, who was a lady, Alea Horowitz, in the 18th century. She was the daughter of a famous rob. Her brother was Zitzikul Hamburger, if that means anything to you. Let's put it this way. He's a chavrusa with the Nebuhuda. So she was 
from the rabbinic elite, raised in a very hush and refined background, you're going to laugh at what I'm going to say. She knew Shas, okay, because she was like Ento, you know, they picked it up at home. And she used to give the Bechinas to, uh, to, to the students and all this stuff. It's one of those uh, famous cases. And a person of great intense religiosity and piety, and she expresses it in Yiddish Techinas that she composes. And so look what we have over here. In her Hebrew introduction, Leah argues that women's prayer has the power to bring the Geula if women pray properly. The women's davening counts more because the women, by definition, she says, this is what she said, give more feeling to it, more, more passion. She furthermore states, and by the way, there's more reasons than that, that because women's prayers can bring the Geula, women should daven and shul every day, morning and evening, and she laments the fact that this is not the practice. She had a Kabbalistic understanding of prayer because her family, of these are the elite, biggest rabbis in the 18th century. The Horowitz, take my word for it. Uh, and true prayer is not for human needs, but for the reunification of the sundered spheros of Tiferes and Shechina, and all the Shem Yichud Kutsha and all that. Uh, because most women have little knowledge of mystical literature and concepts, her purpose in writing this text, Yiddish, is to teach women without specialized knowledge how to daven properly for the sake of the redemption of the Shechina from the Shechina's exile with weeping. Okay? Now why weeping? This is from the Gemara. At the end of the day, what, and you know this, what is it that causes God to end the, the, the exile? What do we say? It's a Rachel crying. <laughs> Rachel crying. What about all the guys davening? That's good too. Rachel crying. Rachel Mavaka Baneho. What does that mean? She's like, you see over here, it's the woman has a power in the davening and the expression and the crying that can move the Rabbanu Shalom in a way that men can't. And so she says over there, following Kabbalistic sources, she attributes great power to tears. So you should recite, I'm sorry, I skipped something over here. Uh, Leah's purpose in writing the text is each woman that knowledge how to pray properly for the sake of the Shekinah was weeping. Following Kabbalistic sources, she attributes great power to tears. Elaborating what's um, already a focus on women's piety, she made Tchines for the Rosh Chodesh. You know, the women have a special holiday Rosh Chodesh, as I think everybody knows, because they were heroic during the Golden Calf episode. She provides a framework that she believed could bring the Geula. So if you have a highly intelligent person, and it's a passionate, and she's composing something in Yiddish, and she's pouring her heart in it, that she's going to bring Geula, I'm telling you it's a powerful Tchina, okay? In the Yiddish portion of her text, she laments the bitterness of the exile, and she names Rosh Chodesh as a time of divine favor. Protection of each of the four matriarchs is invoked. That's why they're called Tchinas Imahos. Okay? This, I told you before, about 15, 20 minutes ago, or longer, I'm introducing to you, I believe, something you only, outside of Judaism you don't even know exists. And once flourished, and no longer does. But for many centuries it flourished, and it was Yiddish. It was Yiddish Davani, which these people said, and it counted more to them in terms of umph than the formal prayers. Uh, you can agree with that, you can disagree with that, and so forth. The central model presents the trouble of the Jewish people dominating by Rachel's grave, and so on and so forth, as I said before. So this is not, as I said before, ten or uh, you know, something uh, uh, a dummy. Uh, this is real davening. Imagine your great-great-grandmother's great-great-grandmother pouring her heart into this. Uh, now maybe she wasn't a shul. Maybe she had to stay home and daven this morning because they had the kids to raise. But when she puts herself in the corner for 10 minutes and she had to do them, you get this kind of stuff. That's a, as far as I'm concerned, that's a heavy topic, okay? And it's not punctuated by no kiddish reason and all the stupidities. This is the real dominant. Many holy emotions over the centuries. Now, I can't end tonight without saying, you had other popular literature. <laughs> you had many books of uh, Shadim, Gagulim, Mazikim, Mechashev. I mean... It's the European market. <laughs> What's going to sell? These stories about Shane and Meister book, you know, about devils and Frankensteins and who's what. That always sells well. Let me ask you the following question. Do your kids read science fantasy and it's all the junk? That's what this is. Of the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. Uh, so where are we going with all this? After the Middle Ages, Yiddish grew and grew. Geographically, demographically, literarily. It didn't replace Hebrew as Lush and Kodesh. It did not seem to. But it turned Jewish cultural insularity, which the Jewish sought, right? The Jewish wanted cultural insularity in Eastern Europe, but they did. The Jewish mental ghetto into not a dark and cramped space, as was the physical ghetto. These are 
already nicer than it really looked. There were, uh, there were ghettos in Italy and in Frankfurt in the 19th century. Early, there was dirtier and filthier and more sunless. It was terrible. That was a physical ghetto. But the mental ghetto, thanks to this kind of literature, which everybody could access, not just a few scholars, the mental ghettos was a luxuriant, beautiful garden full of Yiddish trees and flowers with a literature and a language all Jews, not just, I mean, not Goyim, all Jews could understand. A literature that provided entertainment, inspiration, intellectuality, religious passion, and above all, profound interiority. Hence, the strong feelings about Yiddish that have survived among European Jews and their descendants down to the present day. So in conclusion, the early modern era was a golden age of Yiddish, when the role of Yiddish in Jewish life was not challenged. All this was to change in modern times, as we shall see, and with that I bid you a good night.